All right, ladies and gentlemen, I'm going to try and narrate these lecture notes so that they make some sense. Um, in this chapter, we're going to deal with the graphical representation of data. Remember, the statistical process is collect, analyze, interpret, and present. And so we're really skipping to that last step, which is presentation, because graphs and charts are one of the most common ways that we see statistical data presented. Um, the reason that we use graphs and charts is that raw or ungrouped data, simply our individual observations, is pretty much meaningless. Um, it isn't until we group it or present it in a graph that we can begin to see trends, um, we can look at charts and graphs and make decisions, um, and we can draw conclusions about the data from the way that they look on these charts and graphs. So there are really two types of charts and graphs that we concern ourselves with, and those are quantitative graphs and qualitative graphs. When we look at quantitative graphs, generally that means we have either interval or ratio level data, and we can represent them by histograms, which are a type of specialized bar chart, frequency polygons, which are a cumulative frequency graph, ogives, which is another cumulative frequency graph, dot plots, which are good for small data sets where we represent each individual data point in our data set by a dot on the graph, and then stem and leaf plots, which you're probably familiar with. Um, we break each data point into a stem and a leaf, and we can begin to see um, patterns and shapes in the data. If we only have ordinal or nominal level data, then usually we'll represent it in one of these qualitative graphs, pie charts, bar charts, and then um, one that's very specialized is a Pareto chart. All of the qualitative and quantitative graphs presume that we only have one variable. In other words, we're only looking at one thing height, weight, distance, age, color, brand, make, model. When we have two variables, then we use scatter plots, which are, you probably remember from your math class, our X, Y charts. We have an X variable charted on one axis and a Y variable charted on the other. So moving from ungrouped to group data, the way that we do that is a frequency distribution. You've used frequency distributions, you just didn't know it. So if you've ever filled out a survey where they say, what is your age? And one of the choices is between 20 and 30, 31 and 40, 41 and 50, those are frequency distributions. They summarize the data in, in terms of bins or classes. So they'll pass out the survey, everybody will bubble in the bubble that applies to their age, and then they'll go back and they will literally tally up the number of responses they got in each class or each bin, and they can then chart that and begin to see um, patterns or trends in terms of the age of the people that they surveyed. Um, they vary in shape. Um, the shape is determined by the data and are generally um, constructed based on what the researcher is trying to do or the question they're trying to answer. When we look at this idea of bins or classes, um, there are some hard and fast rules that we have to follow. So we know the classes have to be mutually exclusive and exhaustive. When we talk about mutually exclusive, we mean that no data point could ever be placed in more than one class. Each data point has to have a home and only one home. And when we talk about exhaustive, what we mean is every data point has to have a location. It has to have a bin. So when we get to um, the end of our data, we have exhausted 
all of it and it's all gone into a bin or a class. Um, the classes also have to be contiguous and non-overlapping. That means they need to bump up, right up against one another. So in other words, if I look at from um, 5 to 10 and then from 10 to 20 and 20 to 30, what I know is those don't overlap. And the reason they don't overlap is because the way that we read a bin is from 10 up to, but not including 20. From 20 up to, but not including 30. From 30 up to, but not including 40. And that makes them contiguous and non-overlapping. So the rule to follow is making sure that each observation fits into one and only one bin or class. So we have to make a decision about how many bins or classes we use. So we want it to be representative of the underlying data. Some data has what we refer to as natural breaks. In other words, grades. Grades fall into five classes. You have from zero to 59 is an F, from 60 to 69 is a D, from 70 to 79 is a C, and so forth. Um, sometimes we don't have those natural breaks and no one has told us how many classes to use. In that case, we use what's referred to as a two to the K rule, where K represents the number of classes in our distribution. And when we do the math and raise two to the power of K, our result is larger than N, where N represents a sample size. For instance, if I have a data set that has 50 observations, I will take two and multiply it to itself until I get to a value that's greater than my n of 50. So I would say 2 times 2 is 4, times 2 is 8, times 2 is 16, times 2 is 32, times 2 is 64. So I have to raise 2 to the fifth power before I get to a number greater than 50. And in that case, that value of k, the number of twos that you used will represent the number of classes. So when we look at constructing a frequency distribution, there's literally five steps. First, I have to determine the range of the data, and that's good old-fashioned difference between the highest and the lowest number. So I'm going to take the highest number, I'm going to subtract the lowest number, and that's going to give me the range. Then I'm going to set the range aside for a little while, and I'm going to turn around and determine the number of classes. Remember we said we want, you know, don't want too many because then the data slice too thin. If we get too few, we've clumped it together and you don't get any real shape out of the data. Um, a lot of times people will say that somewhere between 5 and 15 classes is customary, but that's not a hard and fast rule. Um, if your data fits best into 4 or is better represented by 20, then you make that decision as the researcher. Um, if we don't have the naturally occurring splits, again, we're going to use that 2 to the K rule. So we're going to take step 1 and step 2 and we're going to use it in step three to determine the width of the class interval or bin. And we're going to take the range that we found in step one. We're going to divide it by the number of classes we found in step two. And we are going to then round that up to the next whole number. Even if range divided by number of classes is a whole number, we want to move one number further. We want to make our class one number wider 
And the reason for this is that if you make your class widths too small, when you get to the last class, your very largest data points are not going to have a home. They're not going to have any place to be put. And you're going to get to start all over again. So you'll only do that once. So then we're going to construct the classes or bins. So I'm going to look at my data and I'm going to find the lowest value in the data set. And I'm going to set that as the lower boundary of the first bin or class. I'm then going to take that lower class limit and I'm going to add the class width and that will give me the upper class limit. Then I'm going to take that upper class limit. It's going to become the lower class limit of my next class. I'm going to add the width and I'm going to have an upper class limit. I'm going to take that second upper class limit. I'm going to make it the lower boundary for my third class. I'm going to add the width. I'm going to come up with the upper class limit for the third class. And I'm going to keep doing that until I have the number of classes that I determined in step two. In step five, I'm literally going to quote unquote place each data point into the class. In other words, I'm going to look at my class classes. And I'm going to look at my data and I'm going to say, wow, the value of 12 falls into the third class. I'm going to make a tick mark or a tally mark, and I'm going to cross that one off. Then I'm going to find the number 25. I'm going to say, oh, that goes in my fourth class. I'm going to make a tally mark or a tick mark. In that class, I'm going to cross off that data point, and I'm going to move to the next. And I'm going to continue to place my a tick mark for every data point into the class. And when I'm done, the number of tally marks in each class will represent the class frequency. So here's one that I did based on chicken weights. So what we did was we gave chickens various types of feed and supplements and we looked at their growth weight. So when we applied our two to the K rule, what that told us was we needed seven classes. So you'll see those lower and upper limits on your classes. The first class goes from 100 up to, but not including 150. The next class is 150 up to, but not including 200. 200 up to, but not including 250. In other words, in that first class, the lowest value that I could place in that class would be 100, and the highest would be 149.99 repeating. As soon as I get to 150, that belongs in the second class. That second class the lowest value will be 150.00 repeating, and the largest will be 199.99 repeating. The next column in the distribution is midpoint, and the midpoint is simply the center of each one of those classes. So what you'll see is for the first class, we took 100 plus 150. That gave me 250. The halfway point at 250 is 125. So in other words, to get the class midpoint, add the lower and upper limit and divide it by 2. So 150 plus 200 gave me 350. 350 divided by 2 is 175. That gives me that class midpoint. The next column you see simply shows the width and we represent that so that someone using our frequency distribution would know that all of our classes had the exact same width and the width is 50. The next column is frequency. Frequency is simply the number of tick marks that I made when I was sorting my data or dumping my data into these classes and bins. So from looking at this distribution, 
I know that seven of my observations were between 100 and 149.99 repeating. In the class from 250 to 300, there were 13 observations that were between 250 and 299.99. And I continued to move these uh, tally marks to create the frequency until all of my observations had been placed in the distribution. What you know from looking at that column is that there were 71 of these chicken weight observations in my data set. The sum of your frequency column must always equal n or the number of observations that you have in your sample or your data set. The next column is relative percentage. And what that gives me is relative to the entire distribution, what percentage of my observations fell in any one class. The way that relative percentage was derived was I took the class frequency and divided it by the total number of observations that I had. So for the first class, I took 7 divided by 71, gave me 9.9%. The second class, 10 divided by 71, gave me 14.1%. 15 divided by 71 gave me 21.1%. So to come up with relative frequency, I took the class frequency divided by the total number of observations. And when I get to the end of that relative percentage column, it should sum up to 100%. The last two columns in our distribution are cumulative or running total frequencies and relative percent. So it's simply a running total. Um, the same way that you keep a running total if you play gin rummy or your GPA. Um, I begin my cumulative frequency by taking the frequency of the first class. For my second one, I take the frequency of the first class plus the frequency of the se second class so 7 plus 10 gave me 17. I took the 17, I added the next class of 15, that gave me 32. I took the 32, I added the frequency of 13, that gave me 45. I took the 45, I added the 17, it gave me 62. I took the 62, I added the 7, it gave me 69. And when I added the 69, and the two observations from the last class, it gave me 71. The last value in a cumulative frequency column should be the same as the number of observations in your data set. So now the column that is cumulative percentage, I've done the same running total except this time instead of using frequencies, I used the percentages. So I did it the exact same way. I started with 9.9, .9. I came down and added the 14.1, gave me 23.9. Took the 23.9, I added the 21.1, gave me 45.1, and so forth. So when I got to the bottom of the cumulative percentage, my last value should have been 100%. What that tells me is 100% of my data um, has been accounted for in terms of relative percentage. Um, if you go back to your lecture notes, the ones you have posted, this is simply a summary of what I just talked about, how we came up with the midpoint, what the frequency is, how we get the relative frequency, 
the cumulative frequency as a running total, and the cumulative percentage frequency. So this is the first of the charts that we can construct from a frequency distribution, and it is a histogram. It plots the class limits or the class boundaries on the x-axis and the frequencies in the y-axis. So that first bar on your histogram represents the class from 100 up to but not including 150. The second bar is the second class, 150 up to 200. The third bar is 200 up to 250. So if we went back and looked at our distribution, you can see that the upper and lower limits coincide with these individual. So this is the first class, this is the second class, the third, the fourth, the fifth, the sixth, and our seventh. The next graph that we look at is a frequency polygon. And what you can see is that these inflection points, let me get my pen back, give me my pen, these inflection points are the class midpoints. So if we drew a straight line down, we would get, we would know that this was a, the class midpoint of the first. If we drew this line down, this would be the class midpoint because this is our second class, third class, fourth class, and so on. So the points are the class midpoints. This percentage here represents the relative class frequency. Remember that was gotten by getting class frequency divided by total frequency. The key to a frequency polygon is it is always anchored at the x-axis. Because what we need to be certain of is that 100% of our data falls inside of our distribution. And the only way that we can be certain that we have 100% of our data inside is to anchor it, right, so that nothing leaks out. All right, now we have an ogive, right, which is a cumulative percentage, right? So it's cumulative, so we know that an ogive always rises, right? It's going to rise from 0% up to 100%. Right. Um, the usefulness of a... Um, of an ogive is that we can determine how much data we have um, between or how much it changes right, um, between these endpoints. And the way that we do that is we look at the rise over this run. So I can see here that these are fives so I've got mm, probably about five here, and I'm going up to 25 here. So I have one, two, three. So this rise right here in this graph represents about 15%. And I am the worst person in the world um, drawing on this thing, but hopefully you're getting the idea. Right. There is a video posted in Blackboard where I read and interpret one of these ogives um, in much more detail. So I recommend um, taking a look at that video. 
Now I'm going to look at the dot plot, right? Remember, every individual observation is plotted. Um, it's only good for small data sets. If you had a huge data set, um, it would just look like a million little dots and would be really unuseful. What I'm looking for here is I'm kind of looking at shape um, and I'm looking for any weird ones that may be separated from the pack um, because I may question those to see if they're just weird observations um, and as you'll learn later in the class um, potentially could be outliers. Um, the other thing that I want to begin to look at is I want to begin to look at shape. So I'm kind of looking at shape and I can kind of see that I have a big clump here. I've got a bigger clump here, um, but the rest of them are pretty evenly distributed. So if I'm looking to see what my data is telling me about observations or chicken weights that might be very common, um, I can begin to see that from my, um, from my dot plot. Now I look at my stem and leaf plot, right? And so hopefully what you'll remember is these on the left are the stems, these over here are the leaves. What I've actually done is I've just deconstructed my, um, my data points. Every data point in the distribution is represented. And what you'll see is that I have one, two, three kind of groups. So if I wanted to look at these, I would know that my underlying data numbers, that I had a 10, I had a 12, I had a 13, I had one, two, three, four fourteens, because in a stem and leaf, one stem and one leaf equals one data point. If I didn't know how many observations were in my data set, if I counted all of my leaves, counted up every single one of them, I would then be able to know that the number that were in my, my original data set. The other thing about a stem and leaf is that if we turn it on its side, we can begin to kind of see shape again. Remember, this is all about interpreting and presenting data in a way that it's meaningful. Um, stem and leaf plots, again, are really only appropriate for small data points. Um, data sets rather and usually you want them to be fairly small values um, once you begin to construct stem and leaf points plots with um, data points that are measured in hundreds or thousands um, they become very confusing and much less um, useful so we've got um, a couple of qualitative graphs. Remember, pie chart is just a proportional representation of the categories um, based on the 360-degree circle. Um, bar chart is a frequency of one or more categorical right, variables. When we talk about categorical variables, really what we're talking about is either nominal or ordinal level data. Um, and then we have a Pareto chart, which is a um, quality chart that tracks defects. It's very specialized, and it's used when we do quality improvement in industry. So I'll show you an example of each. So here's our pie chart, right? This is the underlying data. And so we can see that ExxonMobil has, out of the 1 million 84,042, whatever this is, um, ExxonMobil has 453,123, which converts to 41.8%. So we know that this slice of ExxonMobil's pie here is that 41.8%. I feel comfortable that everybody's seen and worked with pie charts. Um, Bar charts are simply 
um, one, two or more categories on one axis. So we know that um, if, these, if this is the amount spent, we can see here for miscellaneous, it's $93.72. So that falls just shy of 100. If we looked at clothing and accessories, that would be this bar here. And we know it was 134.40, so it's a little bit shy of 150. The biggest thing that differentiates um, a bar chart from a histogram is you notice that there are gaps in between the um, items in a bar chart, and we never have a gap in a histogram because the histogram is constructed from contiguous, touching, non-overlapping um, categories or classes. This is our Pareto chart, and what you'll see is that it tracks the frequency of defects, and it go, always goes from most common cause to least common. So when I look at this Pareto chart, I know that poor wiring is the number one cause of defects or problems, um, and it allows me to then focus in on that when I'm doing process improvement. Um, in um, courses where we study non-parametric statistics, um, the Pareto chart is um, plays a big role. I simply want you to know that it's a specialized type of bar chart that tracks root cause failures or reasons for poor quality. Um, and then last but not least is this bivariate scatter plot, right? Um, so I'm going to show you um, what we know is every one of these dots represents a value from the x-axis and a value from the y. I think you remember this from probably pre-calculus. So I know that that point right there had an x value here and a y value here. So the key um, to reading scatter plots is this idea of whether or not we have correlation. And correlation is simply direction. So in this one, we have a positive correlation because it's moving up and to the right. And what I know is that as the value of x rises, the value of y rises. And that gives us this positive correlation. In our negative correlation, what we know is as the value of y falls, the value of x falls. So it's a negative correlation which is represented by a slope downward and to the right. This one shows no correlation. There's no way that I can draw a, if I can draw, um, a straight line through it in any direction that will give me any kind of pattern. We like to think of these as looking kind of like <clears throat> a shotgun blast where they're just scattered all over, um, but we don't see any um, change in, there's no consistent change in X for a change in Y, and so we just consider that to say there's no correlation. So, that takes us to the end of the lecture notes. Um, I recommend that you look at some of the videos that are posted in the um, module content um, for a more detailed explanation of some of these. Um, but hopefully um, narrating um, the best that I could, these um, lecture notes will help you get through module two until I see you in class.